Hey there, today we have more answers from an airline pilot. My husband is going to be answering your most asked questions over the last couple of months about flying in an airplane these days. The number one question is, has turbulence gotten worse with the environmental changes? Not really. I think we just have a better ability to detect it. So we see more of it now because we have better technology to see it than we used to have years ago. Okay. All right. And another person has the same question that I had this summer. You are stuck on the tarmac or you have not even left the gate inside your airplane, but you have boarded the airplane. No air conditioning is on. It is burning up hot. Why is it like that? And why does it take so long to get the air conditioning back on? What's that whole process? So uh, on the ground, airlines usually try to condition the air of the airplane using a, a air conditioning unit that's hung underneath the jet bridge because it saves a lot of money because onboard air conditioning, we have to use jet fuel and that's very expensive. Okay. So we try to use- uh, That's not enough. I want more. Ground-based air. <laughs> Unfortunately though, a big tube has to come out of the air conditioning unit and go into the belly of the airplane so it can be distributed throughout the airplane. And a lot of times those tubes have lots of kinks. And so it may come out of the air conditioning unit very cold, but by the time it gets to the airplane, it's really significantly down in volume. Uh, we feel the same way. So when we get on the airplane, if it's hot, we're gonna start the auxiliary power unit, which is the little jet engine in the tail that will provide much more robust air conditioning. But that usually happens once we get on and sometimes we're late to the airplane uh, because we're getting off another airplane and so they've already started boarding the airplane without us there and so that may be explain why it's hotter than usual. But you can always tell your flight attendant it's hot and they can hopefully get someone to come help us out. Okay, um, our viewer wants to know, it, is the same thing happening in the cockpit? Oh yes, like if you're it, stuck actually there. it's worse in the cockpit because we have all those windows. Okay, So the plane I was on, the door was open we had all boarded the airplane. The crew was on board. We were waiting for somebody. Mm -hmm. Why? I just, I couldn't tell you. It just, some, somehow there's a miscommunication and someone saying we need the air that you guys provide off the gate disconnected so we can use the air on the airplane. We're not supposed to use both at the same time. And do you usually only run the air conditioning once you start taxiing or driving? No, it's usually the minute we get on and start the power unit in the back. Okay, one other question I just thought of. Who drives the airplane down the, the like to the runway? Traditionally, the captain does. Okay, yeah. and captain that's called taxiing. taxiing. Captain does all the taxiing. One of our viewers named Kathleen wants to know, is it true that it's safer to fly in the summer rather, in the winter rather than in the summer? I wouldn't really say it's safer, just the weather's in a different spot. So in the summer, we have to work our way around thunderstorms, which are very large storms that go very high up 60,000 feet. But in the winter, we deal with snow and ice, which is on the ground. So it may be more, uh, we have more ground-based issues, slippery runways, slippery taxiways that we deal with on the ground in the winter, which you might consider to be not safe. But in the air, it's usually clear. So it's just, it, I don't really think it's one safer than the other. It's just in a different place in the flight. If there is a disturbance in the boarding area or inside the airplane, at what point do the pilots get involved? Uh, if it's at the gate, we don't. We usually just call, uh, we have, it, most airlines have a trained person who is trained to deal with conflicts. And if we deem that that passenger is not or deemed to be a threat later on in the flight, we'll have him removed and put him on a different flight or something like that. But rarely do we get involved. Uh, I choose not to get involved uh, because we have people trained on the ground to take care of those situations. But we just need to call them and tell them to come down to the airplane. And in, inside the airplane, when you're flying, at what point would you, or like in the boarding process, if they're being rude to a flight attendant, I mean, you can throw them off. Since you're the captain, mm -hmm. you have the decision to get them off of the airplane before it even, if the people have already boarded and now they've caused a disturbance. Right, and, and that's always the last result. Uh, I don't ever want to yank right. someone off an airplane. We'll try right. to resolve the situation between the either the passengers or the passenger and the flight attendant. But if it's something I'm concerned is going to get worse once we're airborne, it's much easier to deal with on the ground with the mm -hmm. door open. But, and then I will call in our trained people to come take care of that. Um, but. I usually do not go back and talk to the passengers, try to reason with them because in the days of cell phones and cameras, it's going to always be taken out of context. 
Uh, and so we'll just either have a chat in the jet bridge or if I don't think it's going to get resolved, I would rather not have the person on the airplane. Okay. So they can cool down a little bit. And... Do you have to, I mean, would you divert a plane to a different city? If... Or do the flight attendants, are the flight attendants prepared to, I don't know, pin, uh, like zip tie that person? We, we have procedures. We have procedures for that. And okay. yes, if, if the flight attendants were telling me what was going on in the back and I deem that to be something as a threat to the airplane, I will get it on the ground and get law enforcement involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, another viewer wants more information about like the sudden drop in altitude, like um, that happened to me going up to Pennsylvania when we were first early married. We were on, I was on an airplane at night in like a 20 seater airplane and it feels like you're dropping like a hundred miles in one second. Normally it's just weather where two air masses come together that are different, a warm front and a cold front where those two meet you're always going to have uh, just diff up drafts and down drafts. Uh, the bigger the airplane, it, it, I would equate it to being on a three-person boat in the sea with rough seas or being on a cruise ship in the seas. The smaller the airplane, the worse it feels. The bigger the airplane, just the momentum of the airplane, it won't feel as bad. So it's just part of weather. Okay, but y'all are y'all know it's coming or you are prepared to like grab hold well, of the steering wheel kind of thing? We're always prepared for that. But, okay. Uh, we can know it's coming either by airplanes ahead of us that have reported uh, rough air. Uh, we have software on our iPads that kind of predicts where they think it's going to be. And then there's always forecasts anywhere where you see a frontal boundary where two air masses are different. You're most likely going to see either some kind of thunderstorm weather or you're going to know that that's probably where you're going to have the rough air. Okay. All right, and then somebody else wants to know why a flight attendant would go into the cockpit when one of you comes out to go to the restroom. So there always has to be one pilot at the controls of an airplane, always. And if I were to leave and close the door and leave the first officer up there, to open the door, the first officer would have to get up out of his seat to open the door to let me in, and therefore there'd be nobody momentarily flying the airplane. Mm -hmm. So we bring a flight attendant up there to act as the door person to let uh, us back and forth. And then there's been some incidents in the past where they don't want to leave one person alone um, due to a, an incident that happened in, in Switzerland years ago about the first officer locked the captain out and let him back in mm. and did something very damaging to the airplane. So, or if something, if he passed out correct, by himself. Correct. So there always has to be somebody flying the plane. So that's why the flight attendant is brought up there is okay. to act as our door guard or the doorman woman. Catherine also wants to know, do they have to have a certain skill set in order to be that door person? No, I know the movies Airport 77 made it sound like the flight attendants are trained to fly the airplane, but they're not. There's no special oh. qualification. And I'm not quite sure how they determine who goes up there. Mm. Um, sometimes they just want a break to get away from the passengers. Sometimes they want to look out the window or other mm -hmm. times it's just the luck of the draw. Whoever the chief flight attendant, the purser on the plane assigns to go up there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why can't we hear the pilots sometimes? <laughs> Uh, it's it's twofold. Uh, the first one is uh, the radios that we talk to air traffic control are far more sensitive than the mm -hmm. system, passenger address system we talk to the people. So I think we just tend to talk quietly because that's what we're used to talking. And notoriously, public address systems on airplanes are usually not the highest quality. Mm -hmm. So it just comes out sometimes kind of garbled. Mm -hmm. Or they talk too fast sometimes. Or they put the microphone too close to their mouth so it sounds like they're swallowing it. So it's all garbled. Oh, okay. So. And then one of my friends wants to know why do we have to have the window shade open in, on takeoff and or landing? So when in, in, a, in a boarded takeoff or a, some kind of bad landing where we have to get out of the airplane, sometimes there may be, depending on where the airplane is, maybe some exits that are not usable because there could be a fire in front of the door. There could be some damage that that exit is not usable. And one of the ways to, to kind of figure out which exits are usable is to be able to look out the airplane and see. So we ask the window shades to be up to aid us in saying, we all have to get out, but don't use that exit because that one's not usable. We won't even open the door if it's not usable. And then that just it means we have to divert people to the remaining exit. So it's just to get better situation of what is around the airplane if we're getting ready to evacuate.
Another viewer wants to know who, what, or when is the determining factor for the pilots to turn back to the original departure city or to the nearest airport? Uh, it does vary by airline and every airline has their own security protocols uh, that deal with anything from just an intoxicated passenger to someone trying to breach the flight deck and take control of the airplane. But we normally, most airlines, we don't publish or talk about what those protocols are just for security reasons. Okay, what if it's, um, you're going across the ocean? Is there a point at which it's too late to go back or you've got enough fuel or something to keep going? Like I said, it would, be, it would be very much situation-based, but okay. uh, most of the time there's always an airport we can get to within two hours, even if we're flying over the ocean. Another viewer wants to know, when you're flying a long-haul flight, when do you sleep and who sleeps? <laughs> so any flight that's over eight hours has to have more than two pilots. So that way uh, we can switch out. So usually between eight and 10 or eight and 11 hours, we have an additional pilot, so a total of three. And then anytime over 12 hours, we'll have four pilots. So while two of us are flying, one sleeping, and then we take the flight, let's say it's a nine hour flight divided by three, each of us get about a three hour break. So then as soon as my three hours are up, I go to the back and then the other pilot comes up. So there's always two pilots up there. We just rotate our breaks based on the length of the flight. Okay, and what if both pilots that are up there just happen to fall asleep at the same time. Well, we hope that never happens because we use coffee and other things to keep us awake. But today's airplanes have technology in them that if the airplane has not sensed any buttons or that buttons have been pushed or a uh, mouse pads been touched, after a certain period of time, it'll beep. And then if nothing's done after a certain period of time, it'll beep even louder. And then if nothing, it starts beeping very loud so that if we did both fall asleep, that, that noise would wake us up. Okay. So. Thankfully. <laughs> if any of you are worried about turbulence, we do have an entire video dedicated to his tips about turbulence in an airplane. So be sure to check that out. We have a whole series now. I think we're up to five or six videos in this uh, pilot question series. So take a look at that and say, hey, if we have not met yet, thanks for your time. Let's let's do this and we'll freeze. Oh, I do that no, too. No, <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna say like, okay, like look at the camera like, it's not my fault. We're doing a picture though on the video. Yeah, I'll be able to screenshot okay. it. Okay. Okay, let's do another one. Hold it for like five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Don't smile. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's not how normal poses work. <laughs> okay, just say I don't know. It's not my fault. Okay. <laughs> okay, ready? <laughs> you taxi the airplane. That's so cute. <laughs> <laughs>